I have the honor and privilege today of introducing my longtime friend and colleague, uh, Francis Alvarez of the uh, University uh, Ecole Supérieure de Nomo uh, de Lyon. Uh, Francis is probably well known to most of you as a textbook author, uh, a great uh, uh, proponent of studies of planetary science, a uh, generator of huge models for uh, uh, stu uh, understanding major aspects of Earth evolution, its formation, uh, mammal geochemistry, water geochemistry, pretty much everything under the sun on the Earth. But even that was not enough to keep uh, Francis' curiosity in, uh, in check. So today, Francis actually is going to be speaking to us on the isotopes of disease. Thank you, Rick. Uh, wow, that's a, that's a lot of people. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to try to, as uh, Paul McMillan said, to pretend that I'm just in a bar sharing a beer with uh, Ian Giver, <clears throat> try to convince you. But before I, <clears throat> I go on with my this talk, uh, I would like to spend 20 seconds on the great man, the man who is on the was an, uh, one of the last giants who disappeared. He passed away uh, earlier this year, and this man cover every base from uh, from meteorites to uh, to the ocean. His contribution was enormous, and on top of it, uh, it was a living proof that you can be a nice person and a great scientist, which some, sometimes you wonder whether this is possible. <clears throat> and uh, it, it helped me a lot in the early days of my career when I was working on hydrothermal vents. So think of, uh, of Carl, he was a great, great scientist and a great, great man. So now I'm going to give that talk, which initially was planned as a talk for the session, which is on top, Impacts of Geochemistry, and uh, which, is, uh, which will be given uh, later in the afternoon, organized by John Ladden, Max Coleman, and myself. And I'm going to venture into something. I mean, you, you saw a Cartierian citation. Uh, all the grad students uh, were aware of that uh, wonderful citation, that no field is immune to the invasion of isotope geochemistry. <clears throat> and uh, now we're going we're gonna to add one extra field. So. So, which is how to use the metal isotopes uh, to understand disease, uh, to find biomarkers, and maybe one day to uh, cure some of them. We don't know. <clears throat> Before I get started with, uh, with the science, I would like to uh, thank all the people who have been part of this adventure. In Lyon, you can tell Philippe Teluc, who initiated a lot of this work, Vincent Balter Claire, and the students, Claire Viajawan and uh, Aline Lambou, my friend Toshi Fuji, who's the genius of uh, ab initio calculation at the nuclear reactor in Kyoto, uh, and uh, different groups, uh, medical groups, who helped us uh, move forward by providing samples or just uh, <clears throat> uh, telling us that what we were saying was just sheer nonsense. Uh, <clears throat> difficult to find some funding uh, for that kind of science. Uh, wherever you go, uh, people think they don't understand, or unfortunately they think they understand. Uh, but it's okay. Uh, so the outline of this talk will be uh, in, uh, will contain several parts. First, a historical introduction, principle of isotope fractionation. I'm going to go back. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that not, not all of you are familiar with this principle. I'm going to try to be quick and simple. And I'll present some uh, factual data on isotope fractionation of metals in different animals, like uh, mouse, sheep, and later in humans. Uh, provide a cellular perspective on uh, how metals are regulated within uh, biological material and uh, give you some uh, early results uh, on clinical studies. And that's an, that's an important part. I, this is really a lively uh, activity, taking a large chunk of my time at this moment. So back to history. I dare, I, I'm sorry, I hope that uh, Friedhelm von Blankenburg won't hate me for calling him history, but... Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> 
uh, his group uh, was the first to point out that there were some isotope differences in different components of uh, blood and uh, human being, and they analyzed, they found out some important things like uh, sexual dimorphism in mean, but it means that uh, men and women are not the same. That we had a vague idea about it before, <laughs> but isotopically there is, a, there is a substantial difference and that was something important. It also showed up that the <clears throat> isotopes are fractionated uh, during uptake from the environment. We eat something and isotopes are immediately fractionated. Also demonstrated a fractionation of iron isotope between different organs. That was a very, very important paper and uh, thank science for publishing such a risky material. And the same group went on and uh, identified some problems with uh, isotopes uh, uh, correlating with uh, health problems, okay, and some uh, a very well-known disease like hemochromatosis. Someone with hemochromatosis, hemochromatosis has uh, difficulties with uh, what we call uh, iron regulation or iron homeostasis, and that shows in the, in the isotopes, and that uh, was a very good contribution. A group in Bristol with uh, Chris Oxworth uh, also figured out uh, that mice uh, with, with, uh, with uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease and uh, would uh, actually be uh, some, uh, a good target for investigating with uh, the stable isotopes of zinc and copper, and they could demonstrate that in the mice of brain some different strains of, uh, you know, you have a C4 mice, you have all kinds of things, but you can see it here that <coughs> mice uh, with uh, in, in which you depleted the, prote the, the protein associated with prion and the wild mouse, this is the normal mouse, they are isotopically different. And that was a very, a very nice study. Very difficult to publish one more time. And uh, lately, uh, our group in Lyon with uh, Vincent, Vincent Balter and uh, Philippe Telouk, we started an anal anal analyzing isotopes in the process leading to blood formation, separation of red blood cells from serum, and we could see, we could find, make a cycle of iron, copper, and zinc in this cycle, and we could see that there were some uh, missing links. That was an important thing for us. We demonstrated that creating uh, red blood cells implies some mass balance uh, constraints, and uh, you know, biologists are not really much into mass balance. That's not something they care about. They think, it's okay, what's wrong? It goes in with one composition, goes out with a different composition. What, what the heck? Okay. And I think it's, uh, this is something uh, people, uh, okay, that's, uh, that's what we did. <clears throat> so I'm going to move on with the principles now, where I stop fractionation, and uh, reminding you some very basic things. First, uh, if uh, it wasn't for quantum mechanics, there wouldn't be isotope fractionation. And it is a reflection of the Heisenberg principle, a certain principle that you cannot know the position and velocity of a particle with infinite precision, so it leads to the existence of the zero-point energy, and that zero-point energy is actually the cause of isotope fractionation, at least the one we see. <clears throat> Another strong point to remember is the energy of a bomb increases with its vibration frequency and therefore increases uh, and therefore decreases with the atomic weight of the binding metal isotope. Uh, well, I'll, come, I'll go back to this point. And the third point, of course, and, uh, which is uh, the preferential fractionation of heavy isotopes into strong bonds with respect to weaker ones because it minimizes the energy. That's the reason why uh, uh, water and, uh, and liquid water are isotopically heavier than gas in general for, for hydrogen or oxygen. <clears throat> so what, what is the reason for this uh, fact is that there is a measure, there are a number of measures of uh, forces of the bonds between molecules. And you can use a different criteria. You can use electronegativity, Pauling electronegativity, for instance, or you can use the first ionization energy. And you see that the attachment of an atom for its electron uh, increases uh, in, in a very specific way. And you see here that oxygen 
Uh, and nitrogen really like their electrons much more so than, uh, than uh, sulfur. And so it, it's going to be very important because you can see that the vibration will be different. The forces relating the two things are going to be very different. And so we're going to see different isotopic differences associated uh, with the nature of the bond. Oxygen will give you strong bonds and sulfur will give you soft bonds. So we can see that uh, <clears throat> when I plot that kind of uh, diagram, this potential energy between an, uh, <clears throat> an atom and an electron here, there is a zero point energy here. Can you see it never go by, uh, down to the minimum? And uh, the heavy bond here, the heavy, the, the, the heavy isotopes here is at the lo in the lower position with respect to the light isotopes. Uh, this is from Bruno Renard. Uh, it's a, this is Raman spectroscopy in magnesium hydroxide. When you substitute hydrogen by deuterium, you see that the frequency increases, uh, uh, increases drastically. So uh, all the factors are here. We have uh, two things. We have the weight of the individual, and we have the strength of the bond, which control the distribution of, uh, of isotopes uh, between the different, uh, the different bonds. So now, soft bond, hard bond, big guys, small guys. <clears throat> so uh, in order to figure out what's going to happen, uh, I, we enlisten Fred Moignier and I enlisten the our friend Toshi Fuji from the nuclear reactor, and he started calculating basically everything, you know, and uh, doing some ab initio calculations, same way as uh, uh, Ed Schrobel and some other people have been doing, but uh, uh, Toshi has been working a lot on this, and produces some extremely interesting results, and uh, these results confirm exactly what we see here, is that if we think of the fractionation factor, I mean, the possibility, the, the capability of uh, accumulating heavy isotopes as a difference between two factors. These are, these are partition function ratios. If between species A and spe species B, you can plot this log beta here, and these log betas are exactly what Toshi calculated, or, or the, the group at UCLA, the group in Bristol here. So you can see that uh, when you have oxides here binding with metals for zinc here, there is a strong value of beta here. When there is a, a, a sulfur involved in the bond here, there is something which is very soft, and, it is, and it's a light isotope composition. Same thing for copper, the same principle, oxygen here, sulfur at the bottom, and we can tell the difference between oxygen, nitrogen, and, and, and sulfur. So <clears throat> now let's move on to the next part of the, of the talk, which is what are we seeing? Okay, and uh, we started, uh, Vincent and, uh, and I and a number of people started taking these poor animals apart. Uh, and they've been well fed for the rest for their life, but this is okay. And uh, we got some, uh, some results. Uh, we wonder whether we should be doing this, but uh, actually um, it's quite useful because we're seeing things that are absolutely consistent. This is beautiful. So this is iron here, this is zinc, this is copper isotopes, different, uh, the delta value is the deviation from the standard value. I assume that you're familiar with this. For instance, these poor mice have a very isotopically heavy zinc and they have isotopically uh, in, their, in their red blood cells and there's, uh, the, uh, their kidneys have an amazingly heavy Copper. This is something we don't understand. I think I have an idea, a vague idea, but we see that, for instance, copper is isotopically heavy in the kidney of mice. You can see that liver here is, a, is isotopically light, and there is a reason for this, and we can come back to this in a minute. Some other people did this, and this is a comparison with what Fred Moignier and, um, and Marie Le Borgne did it in St. Louis, and we have uh, some good correlation between. So it's not just, uh, well, yeah, they measure a few my, mice, well, who cares? I mean, this is very consistent between mice, between labs, between scientists. Okay, 
Fred is my student, but it's not a good reason. <clears throat> and uh, Vincent had uh, taken a, pay, uh, a few sheep apart with the help of some colleagues from Bordeaux and from Ireland and got almost exactly the same, same thing. But what is quite remarkable is that a liver is a liver isotopically. It's not one day heavy and one day light. Uh, the, the, the brain is not one day heavy, one day light. It is, when I'm saying heavy and light, means enriched in heavy isotopes. Okay, that's what it means. And we got the same consistency. And so we can compare different animals here, and there are some, okay, the conclusions are metal isotope composition consists of a particular organ in a particular animal, that's, that's something important, and beyond differences in diet, some organs are isotopically different between species. So you see that's particular to the mice here, to what is particular to the sheep here, and what is similar. We, re we remember that kidney has isotopically heavy copper, that uh, uh, all the, and the animals, the, the bones are isotopically heavy in zinc. Why? Because of phosphates. We're going to the oxygen around phosphates, and that's normal. And that liver is isotopically light in zinc. So uh, this is uh, what we found with uh, these uh, different animals now, and uh, we're going to move on to humans. Before we get started, this is blood. Okay, blood, as you well know, is made of serum, plasma, and red blood cells. What makes red? And red blood cells contain hemoglobin, means a lot of, of iron, and uh, the serum contains a lot of copper. And copper and zinc are, are nicely coupled. Copper and zinc are nicely coupled because the copper is necessary for oxidizing for oxidizing iron. So this is the distribution of these metals in, uh, in these parts, okay? And uh, so if you compare, the first thing this is, uh, that justifies, that accounts for what uh, uh, Valzik and, and von Blankenburg found uh, 10 years ago, there is a difference between men and women. Uh, not just these two, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, you see, these are the red blood cells here, the pink one, I'm sorry to be so conventional, but I, I tend to, to plot women in red, it's not pink, and men in blue. You do whatever you want with this. And this is red blood cells, and this is the serum here, and this is liver. I'm going to go back to liver. Do you see that there is a difference between men and women, okay? Uh, here, and uh, we're going to go back to this and show that this is the uh, uh, oxidation of iron, which is important. And we can see that uh, serum, there isn't much difference, there is a range here. Most of it is probably due to the fact that uh, getting, uh, getting serum without uh, exploding the, the red blood cells is very difficult. Okay, this is uh, the, uh, the differences here. So we have some, uh, we, we haven't yet uh, taken people apart and measure. Uh, liver, uh, brain, and all these things, because there are some issues associated with that. <clears throat> so now we can try to understand uh, to understand the, how the things work uh, with the regulation of metals in the cell. Uh, one thing, uh, three things to remember. The first one is all naked metal ions: copper plus, two plus, uh, iron two plus, three plus. They're extremely poisonous to the body, so they must be hidden somewhere. You, they can smuggle into cells uh, uh, hidden in some big proteins. Metals must be imported to, into cells, uh, uh, and we're going to use the transmembrane importers. They can be presented to the target protein, that's what you call a chaperone, so they, once they cross the membrane, they have to be presented to the guy who needs it within the cell. And then, in the end, it should be exported because you don't keep your zinc and your copper forever in your cell. Otherwise, you're going to be uh, like an iron man. Okay, it doesn't work. And sometimes during the process, you need preliminary oxidation, and we need some guys called oxidase, iron oxidase, copper oxidase. And you need reduction. We call it reductase. Okay, of course. So we have this kind of uh, uh, we have this kind of. Uh, 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 for zinc, for instance, here we have the importers, they're always in green. We have the exporter in, in they're all proteins, they are transmembrane proteins here. This is an exporter, you can measure them. You use a PCR and you measure that apparently relatively easily. And you have this kind of exporter here. This is something very important, I never understood why, why it was there. 
is a is a probably a, someone has been playing with the cell. And then you have exported towards the Golgi here. It was exported to, to fluid inclusion. Sorry, that's not fluid inclusion. This is lysosome. It's about the same. Uh, and uh, with in, uh, things that contain a lot of zinc, like a metallothionine, this is the storage for poisonous metal. When there is poisonous metal in, we hide it in some, uh, something called metallothionine, MT4 for, for frets here. And the mitochondrion, which is the place very convenient for respiration. Okay? We need uh, mitochondrion because we need to breathe and we need to transport electrons. So zinc is important here. So we have these guys, we actually have 14 zinc importers and we have quite a few zinc exporters and we have, we didn't mention, uh, copper is extremely important, that's absolutely essential. This is the nucleus, this is the cell and we have importers but before import we need to reduce copper. So it's copper two plus to copper one plus is reduced. Here and we have a CTR1, is, uh, which is something important in copper, and these are chaperones towards the mitochondrion here, towards something very important. That's the that's the guard of our body. This is called a super uh, uh, superoxide uh, dismutase. This is the guy who's actually keeping an eye on all the oxidant, uh, on all the, the things that can destroy the cell, like a superoxide, for instance, or peroxide. And this, this guy is actually extremely important and uses copper and zinc here. And then exporters. Two exporters are absolutely essential, and they actually created some disease, a Menkes and Wilson disease, when the gene associated with the exporter is not there. Okay, it's called copper ATPase, ATP for adenosine triphosphate, but you don't care. They are exporters of copper. And these are very important because they export, they, they locate in the liver and kidney, and they produce the copper present in the serum, the, the copper which is used to oxidize, to oxidize iron. Okay, this is important. This is, and a number of diseases are associated with this guy called CP, ceruloplasmin. You don't want to remember that, okay? Seriously, okay. And you want to, re uh, you want to, there's an export here with two major proteins, and they are involved in the cancer resistance also, because when uh, you get some platinum in your blood for chemotherapy, uh, platinum is exported through this guy here, and you can measure it here. Okay, and cytochrome uh, oxidase, which is here, is another very important because it's involved in cell respiration. We rest, we we breathe through cytochrome oxidase, but we also die. This is a programmed uh, cell death, or something we call apoptosis, and that's when there is no more programmed cell death. It's a disease called cancer. The cell never dies, and that's important. So it's involved in uh, copper. It's involved in there. Iron is even more complicated, so I'm not going to get too much into detail here, but there is a reduction for uptake here. There is exp export into the bloodstream here with this guy, ferroportein, ephastine. There is reoxidation here. And in a major cell, this is the same kind of process with redox importers and exporters. Storage of, of uh, iron in the form, uh, in the neutral form of iron 3 plus in ferritin here or in transferrin is one of the most important aspects of iron chemistry. Iron is either as hemoglobin in your red blood cells or it's stored somewhere for later use. And actually, women have a small stores, men have big stores, of course. And, uh, and you can use a lot of, this is iron 3 plus, iron 3 plus, and you understand for uh, uh, fractionation, isotope fractionation, it's going to be uh, very important. So now let's make a, a biochemical perspective. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I have, uh, how much time do I have, uh, Rick? OK, OK. There is a, a, an interesting controversy. I thought it would be nice for you to hear about this, you know, the, what I call the blood type controversy. <laughs> and uh, the blood type controversy is that uh, in some countries, uh, people believe that you're, you can use the blood types uh, instead of uh, star signs. You know, we, I married my wife because she's uh, balance, I think. Yeah, this is the only reason I married her. 
in some, in some places you marry someone because it's B-type. And uh, so these are the uh, number of traits here that you can use to pick up your, your, your companion or your, your husband or your, uh, your wife. And, uh, you. and of course, everybody made full of these poor guys who believe in this. But look at this. Look at this. This is great. This is uh, a copper and zinc. The B guys, you know, the B guys are very different from the rest. And we don't understand why, because the, the blood type is just sugar coating on the red blood cell. There's nothing else. It's a, it's just a sugar coating. That's maybe men and women like it to be sugar coated, but I don't know. And there is a difference, of course, that you already saw here in red blood cells between men and women here, and there is a difference between people. This is important because we know, we know that uh, uh, the B types, the, the, the blood types are associated with some diseases like a pancreatic cancer has a, a substantially higher incidence on, on people with a B type. Um, like a stomach, yeah, a stomach cancer is about the same. So can we make sense of the whole thing? So we have to go back to bonds. Bonds. And uh, uh, bonds with what? Bonds with, uh, so this is an amino acid. This is the most important amino acid on Earth, OK? And I love these words. Sweet terion. I don't know how to pronounce that in English, because it's a German word, of course. And uh, you see that. Uh, an amino acid has a nice property. It, 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 is a, it has a nitrogen here and two hydrogen. And here is a, a, is a carboxylic acid, COOH. So take the hydrogen from here and bring it to here. And you have something which can be a base. It can be an acid. And at the same time, you can make it more or less soluble by changing what they call the side chain. So this is the histidine, which is the most important amino acid in the world. It is, it is everywhere. We're all made of histidine. You didn't know that, but uh, it's not. So it's histidine with two nitrogen here and some, some ring called imidazole here. Remember, nitrogen is a, provides hard bond. Now we have a soft bonds. Soft bonds are in cysteine here. This is another amino acid. You remember the acid is here. The nitrogen NH2, the amine radical is here. And there is sulfur here. And this is cysteine. I'm sure that a lot of you, a lot of you have taken cysteine to cure some diseases in your nose and uh, things like this. Or you can have methionine because sulfur here is, is a bit hidden within the, within the molecules. So we have a hard and soft. Uh, we can expect some fractionation in there. How do we expect this? So uh, the rules are going to be relatively simple. Metal ions bond with different amino acids of different strengths. Hydrogen, uh, nitrogen versus sulfur. Proteins in which metal is dominantly engaged in hard bonds, oxygen and nitrogen, should be isotopically heavy with respect to those in which sulfide bonds dominate. So cysteine-rich cysteine proteins should be all the way down in on the scale of isotopic fractionation here. Let me take some, uh, OK, let's go back to this uh, great guy, superoxide dismutase. You know, this is a, such a superoxide, O2 minus here. You don't want that because it destroys everything, and that's, that destroys uh, DNA and starts cancer. So uh, the, the body is really careful at controlling this, uh, this nasty guy here. So what do you see here? You see. Uh, this is zinc, okay, this is another zinc, and you see three histidines here, and you see a sulfate here. Wow, that's, that's going to be really hard. That has to be very positive. That's important. So you see copper in superoxide dismutase, and it's about the same. Now you only have four histidines, so you expect that also copper is going to be relatively heavy. Copper isotopes are going to be rich in copper 65. But now take, let's take the other guy, ceruloplasmin, the CP, you know, the one which is exported by the, AT, the copper ATPase. This guy, of course, he also, they cannot refrain from bonding with histidine, but now there is a methionine, which is a sulfide-rich amino acid, and there is a cysteine here, which is another sulfide-rich. So I expect that ceruloplasmin will have a copper 
depleted in 65 or enriched in the light isotopes. That's what I expected to see. And this is exactly what we're seeing. This is how we make blood. EPO, I think I'm, I'm, most of you are familiar with, uh, interested in bike races are familiar with this, okay? And uh, EPO uh, sends a signal so that you should be producing more red blood cells so you can easy, more easily die of congestion of arteries with too many uh, red blood cells. But uh, essentially, uh, uh, red blood cells are made in the bone marrow and they travel and they are destroyed in the liver. Okay, and this is uh, this uh, this is uh, what uh, Vincent Philippe and I said a couple of years ago: is that isotopically this cycle doesn't hold on. I mean, it doesn't hold together. We need uh, the, the mass balance of this cycle is not good. Okay, we have we have this, and uh, but we can offer a new reading of uh, isotope variations in blood. Remember, these are these copper. These are red blood cells, men and women. And these are actually the serum here. So you can see, you, you can read that with respect to what I just explained, that copper binds with hard superoxide dismutase in red blood cells. So it's positive because it's hard. And uh, with soft ceruloplasmin CP in serum. So it's soft, so it's negative. So positive, negative here. Positive, negative. Most of the copper is present in red blood cell with as SOD, as they say, and most of the copper is in the serum as ceruloplasmin. You can say there's something similar. I'm less uh, convinced by iron. Binds with soft hemoglobin in, hemoglobin is iron, I'm, I'm gonna come back to this, in red blood cell and with hard transferrin in the iron-3 in the serum. And men and women differences can be accounted by different sizes of iron stores. How much how much iron you save for later use. You know, men before they go hunting, they, they pack a lot of iron in their cells because they want to fight with the, with the mammoth. And, uh, and uh, so they need to have a big, women have a small store. So they have to rotate their, to, in order to oxidize their, their iron, they have to rotate their copper and iron much, more fa much faster than, than, than men. So that's a, that's a big difference here. So we can see that in hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, you know, you're familiar, it's a ring, you know, it, it resembles what you find in, in oil. You have something, you have a four nitrogen here, but, uh, and uh, this is uh, actually, there is a difference with high spin, low spin. This is, uh, this is why it is actually uh, 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 relatively depleted in uh, heavy isotopes. And transferring, transferring, oh, look at all that red, this is oxygen. This is oxygen, all that red, so it means it's really tough. So that has to be positive. That's exactly what we're seeing with isotopes in blood. So now what can we do with all this? We've done some stem collection, uh, taken some mice apart and uh, tried to find out something. And we had two projects with the uh, first uh, one led by Vincent here. And uh, we compare steal the data on blood that we are just uh, be talking about and liver, normal liver, uh, liver of a, the normal part of the liver of a person, okay? You take us to analyze the liver, these are the black squares here. Now we analyze tumor, tumor tissue, uh, what we call hepatocarcinome. And clearly all the tissues are projected towards higher copper. So there are different ways of dealing with this, but probably that's a SOD ceruloplasmin balance here, and we're gonna see the complement. Remember that the tumor in the, in, the, in, in the liver is isotopically heavy in copper. So that's, that's an important uh, observation here. And actually we see that the opposite in the, what Vincent analyzed in, in red blood cells and uh, in, uh, in uh, serum here, you see that the red blood cells of people with a HCC is a hepatocarcinome, okay? Liver cancer here. People, healthy people are in green, and the people with hepatocarcinomes are in red. There is a shift here. And that's the same, that's the same with, uh, with serum here. So we're seeing a signal here. We start seeing a signal that something goes wrong in the serum in the red blood cells. Another series of uh, 
case studies is what uh, you call longitudinal uh, investigations. But so you take a person and you follow this person throughout her disease, regardless of the issue. Some people survive, some people actually die. I'm not going to give you any more detail, but something you have to figure out is that copper isotopes is something which is ingrained in our body. Okay? We don't have our blood, the copper in our blood changing widely uh, from one day to the next because I had uh, three extra Chardonnay last night that I shouldn't. It, it, the, the thing is really, I mean, the variation here of the delta value is within plus or minus 0.05%. It's essentially almost, the, it's marginally the, the, the noise here. And so we have uh, three examples here of uh, people. And you see that once you have this uh, copper isotope composition in your blood, you have it for good. So if something goes wrong. And the second thing, remember, OK, this is the total blood. Eh? But this is positive here. This is extremely important. So it's positive if we go back to here. You see total blood is going to be here. And uh, serum is going to be 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.3 to 0.5 below, below the red blood, below the total. total. Now we make uh, some easy statistics. This is not, this is interesting, but it's not interesting. I, I, I put it up because I knew that someone would ask. Okay. We have a healthy people. So these are serum analyses here. Serum analysis, so we have a blue, a man. Uh, this used to be pink, uh, now it's uh, turned into something uh, I can't name anymore. And these are healthy patients, uh, healthy individuals, male and female. And people with disease, in particular with cancer. We see that there is a shift here, which is quite substantial of about 0.3 or 0.4. And what you see is that, what you can say, if you're, the delta 65 copper in your blood is below, let's say, minus 0.1, you'd rather go and see a doctor. Unless you're a minority. I mean, Vincent has investigated some uh, minority, uh, some uh, blood from minority people, and you see some variation from its genetic. That's, that should be very important to check it. So let me introduce you one case of uh, uh, colon cancer, some work we did with the Cancer Center in Lyon with, uh, with uh, Alain Puisieux. And this is copper, and uh, some of you may be aware for themselves or for parents that you follow biomarkers. You follow, they are called the antigens. The antigens, and these antigens are an indication that your body or body of the person you're considering is fighting with cancer. And you have some of them. You have a carcinoembryonic antigen, which is going to be CEA, and uh, calcium and uh, the carbohydrate antigen CEA. So you get, there is a whole series of them. There are uh, dozens of these ones. But this one is used for colon cancer. So you see here the markers. And uh, let's say the, 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 the limit is about 10 for these markers. Below 10, there is nothing you can say. If you are at uh, 500 or 5,000 with these markers, you're not in a good shape. So what you see is in blue copper here, after the identification of the, 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 the health condition here, colectomy, removing part of the colon here, and you see that uh, something is already, is kind of okay, but all of a sudden degrades here. At the same time, the markers, the biomarkers go up. And then when the person recovers here after uh, it has a meta meta uh, hepatic metastasis, but the medication, oh, I put in uppercase, this is for Rick and the uppercase here, yeah. um, uh, Fox here and uh, Fall Fury and Avastin are medic uh, medication used to fight the cancer. They, they can be all kinds of things. I'm not too much into the detail of this, but you see that once they changed the medication here, the patient recovered here, and, and at the same, the markers disappeared, and copper went back up to where it belongs. So you really see that there is a correlation. Another colon cancer case here. Uh, we, this uh, poor person here, 
uh, I can say it's, it's, a, it's a poor woman, it's a, it's a patient here, is uh, had was discovered uh, multiple cancer very early on, okay, in this number of days. But we see something so remove some part of the uh, of the breast because there was a metastasis, remove part of the colon, remove part of the of the liver. These are all the, the, the surgery this person went through. But you can see that already the delta copper here is very negative, minus 0.2, minus 0.3. We're not in the bad, in the bad, in the bad, in the good zone here. At the same time, uh, we don't see, we don't get to see here. You see that there is a problem here because we are 10 to, to, to we're about 100 here for, for CA 199 here, so there is a cancer condition here. And uh, after that surgery really improved the situation here for, 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 uh, for the, the markers here, but it didn't improve too much for, for, for copper. And then copper recovered this. And then this person, all of a sudden this patient got some metastasis in the liver. And you see, oh, it goes down again here. They changed they changed the, uh, the medication here. Uh, you see, we, there is nothing to be seen. These markers, these biomarkers, they don't tell you whether you have a cancer or not. They tell you whether, uh, if you're going through some uh, some treatment, they tell you whether the treatment has an effect or not. And uh, we see that the, the copper is extremely sensitive to this, and then it falls down again. We, they change the, the medication again, and this person is still alive. Breast cancer, yeah. Breast cancer, what do you see? Uh, you see a tumor, the tumor has been removed, and, uh, but that didn't seem to, be, to make such an, uh, a huge effect. We are already in a very negative uh, uh, domain here. So we see that there are some ideas with, uh, with the CA15-3, uh, which is another antigen used for cancer here. But this, this one doesn't tell you anything. This one tells you something. But it tells you, copper is telling you that something is going wrong well ahead of the conventional markers used for cancer. And uh, actually, this person had some uh, 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 surgery, had some changes in, in, uh, in medications, in taxotere and tamoxifen. And then here, you can see that the multiple liver metastases uh, here. And uh, we, we don't have a, a further, further samples here, and this person eventually died. But what is important here is that you see that the, uh, the copper is actually preceding the, uh, the biomarker here in terms of warning against a particular uh, uh, health condition. Another, another breast cancer uh, is uh, this one. This person didn't do well since the beginning. Look at the value of copper, minus 0.4, minus 0.6 here. We're really bad. This person got this medication called myoset. She had, uh, that's, that's, that's the worst kind of breast cancer here. And got, they tried all kinds of, uh, of medications here. These are four things that didn't work. This person remained in the bad zone for copper isotopes, although these these uh, 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 markers here didn't tell us anything, and this one was absolutely marginal. But we knew from cancer that this person was not doing well, whereas the conventional markers were kind of borderline or uh, absolutely absent. So this is the kind of uh, things that we are. Uh, and say we is a royal we. This is uh, mostly Philippe de Luc and the, and the people around him. And uh, we have an expectation that we can actually make a progress on different kinds of cancer with different kinds of isotopes. And uh, this is what, uh, what uh, we've been uh, doing over the last two or three years. So uh, I will uh, conclude with this uh, saying that, uh, let me see, I think I had some... Uh, uh, some nice words to conclude the talk here. And that's uh, metal uh, isotopes have a great uh, medical potential. They can be used as markers of disease. Uh, isotopes of metals in metal proteins offer new insight into bio biochemical processes, immune response and pathology. Very interesting results also on uh, inflammation. 
uh, geochemists need to familiarize themselves with medical concepts. First, you have to understand words. When you deal with, uh, with medical people, you don't understand what they're saying. I, I think they, did it, uh, they, they do that on purpose, but uh, well, you can learn. So you buy books and you learn words. Uh, and uh, immunology is a fantastic science. Uh, physiology is great. And uh, also, we should uh, reach out and uh, tell uh, people in hospitals that uh, we can really help and uh, that our science is not a big secret, but uh, there is a huge potential. And if they come and look at what they're do we're doing, they might find something interesting. And this is my experience in Lyon and some other places. Ariel Anbar has exactly the same kind of uh, response from people in the US. Uh, there is room for uh, actually uh, talking to the medical community and make a progress with these traces. So one more time, Karcherikin was right. Uh, we have found another field to invade. Uh, and I think, uh, I hope it's going to be for the good of humankind. And uh, I'm really delighted that you came so many to listen to that talk. Thank you. The question was, uh, are there populations that have anomalous isotopic composition, subsets of the population? Yes, there are, uh, but they're small. Uh, there was a paper, uh, I hope the author is in the room because I don't remember his or her name. Uh, uh, there were very few samples showing that whether you're vegetarian or a non-vegetarian, a carnivore, I should say, uh, there is a small difference, uh, but on a very small number of samples. Uh, minorities, uh, like uh, Yakuts, uh, that uh, Vincent and Clervia had been working on, show some difference. This is why it is important to establish a baseline for different people before you get started. So the effect of diet is minor. Uh, we suspect, because we don't have enough data, that the uh, uh, genetic effect, the genetic factor, uh, might be important. And as you said, uh, as, you, as, as, as I mentioned, and that was uh, Philippe's idea uh, that contribution was important, is a longitudinal study indicates where you come from, and comparing how you evolve in time will teach you more than taking let's say, half of the room and compare it with the other half of that room and see, well, the, the copper uh, is different between left and right because there is a lot of noise. One of the reasons why people couldn't get much from a trace element data, so they measure bulk trace element concentrations in blood, in uh, red blood cells, and, and we don't get to see much uh, because there is a lot of spread. Other questions? Well, if not, let's thank Francis again for this uh, very interesting talk. You wanted something different? It was different. It was different, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. oh, this is fascinating.